Good morning, church. Let's stand together. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. My praise belongs to you forever. This is my testimony. This is my testimony from death to life. This grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. sons and daughters bought with blood and washed in water sing the praises of the spirit son and father our god will finish what he started our god will finish what he started this is my testimony from death to life I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. All right. Can we clap together? If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things, greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony this is my testimony this is my testimony from death to life please rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous the two and four or the one and three your choice one two three four two two three all right we worship the god who was we worship the god who was we worship the god who is we worship the god who evermore will be Open the prison doors, he parted the raging sea. My God, he 
Let's shout out his praise in the house. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 There's joy in this house today. God bless you. Welcome. We're excited that you are here. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ken. I'm one of the pastors here at Common Ground Northeast. It's my distinct honor to welcome everyone here today. You're here on a very special day. I'm also a member of our Justice and Reconciliation team. And one of the things that we get the privilege and the honor to do today, uh, come on, everybody get ready to celebrate God, is that we're today, you're here on our celebration for Hispanic Heritage Month. Come on, let's give God praise for that. Come on, do a little better than that. Come on, there's joy in this house. Let's give God our best praise. Hallelujah. If you're welcome, and we want to welcome you if you're watching us online, God bless you. We're excited that you are connected to us this morning. Again, you're here on a very special day. Uh, we're celebrating Hispanic heritage today. There's so much going on here at Common Ground Northeast. Uh, if you're, whether you're visiting us or you're a member and you have something that you'd like to convey to us, we'd ask you to fill out one of our Connect cards. If you're watching us online, that can be found on our digital bulletin. If you're here right here in uh, the sanctuary, well, of course, it could be found on the back of the seat in front of you. We want to connect with you. 
We want to know how we should be praying for you. We want to know what you're believing God for. We want to put our faith with your faith. Our God is able. And so thank you again for being here. Thanks for being with us online. We again take, we ask you to go to our digital bulletin to find out all the latest of what's happening. Some really exciting things are happening in our youth ministry as well as two weeks from now we're having a all church pitch in so there's a lot to celebrate here at common ground at least a lot of opportunities to connect and a lot of opportunities to fellowship well am i talking to anyone that loves jesus this morning do you feel the joy of the lord in this place this morning would you do me a favor would you get up and go greet some of your neighbors and tell them how awesome it is to see them this morning come on our meet and greet at this time Well, praise the Lord, everybody, on your way back to your seats. Would you stand with us all over the sanctuary? This is the time where we focus in. Come on, everybody. Come on, stand up with us on your way back to your seats. We're about to do our liturgy. We're about to do the thing that dials us in and declares to God the heart that we brought, the mindset that we brought. So today, as we get ready to dial in and worship God, there's some things that we brought that will allow us to have a greater focus. So today, I profess that I brought into the sanctuary, I brought a focused mind. I am leaving all my issues at your feet, casting all my cares upon you because you care for somebody's dialing in, getting ready for worship. Today, I also profess that I brought an open heart, creating me a clean heart, and continually renew the right spirit within me. Today, I also profess that I brought into the sanctuary attentive ears, 
to hear your word, to hear. Today, not only that, but I also profess that I've brought into the sanctuary my ready tongue. I will sing aloud of your righteousness and show forth their praise. We're just about ready. Today, I also profess, come on, lift them up there, that I've brought into the sanctuary unencumbered hands. We all know worship is incomplete unless I am giving something as well. So today I profess that I've also brought a tithe and or an offering. So I will freely give as I purpose in my heart for God loves a cheerful giver. Today I also profess that I've brought into the sanctuary a prayer offering. all brought something that we need from the Lord. So today, God, I profess that I've also brought, come on church, my expectation that you will speak to my situation and that I will hear from you. For I know that when I leave, I will be better, having spent time in his presence. Come on, we all do the worship verse with me today. But the time is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth for such the Father seeks to worship him. Come on, give God your best praise. Let's worship today. You ready to get a little loose this morning? Feel free to dance. It's okay. Here we go. Here's this how this song goes. God moves in me, I dance like David. The Spirit of God moves in me, I'll dance like David. I'll dance, I'll dance, I'll dance like David. I'll dance, I'll dance, I'll dance like David. If the Spirit of God moves in me, I'll dance like David. If the Spirit of God moves in me, I'll dance. Like David, I'll dance, I'll dance, I'll dance like David. I'll dance, I'll dance, I'll dance like David. Okay, now I, I feel like we we got the beat, but I feel like the language might be the wrong language to be using right now. You guys want to do this in Espanol? Yeah. See. All right, here we go. Si el Espíritu de Dios se mueva en mí, yo danzo como David. Si el Espíritu de Dios se mueva en mí, yo danzo como David. Yo danzo, yo danzo, yo danzo como David. Yo danzo, yo danzo, yo danzo como David. Okay, that's good. Let's keep doing this. Let's sing this. Sing this to God that we will dance like David before him. Spirito di Dio si mueva a mi, io danzo come David. Si lo Spirito di Dio si mueva a mi, io danzo come David. Io danzo, io danzo, io danzo come David. Io danzo, io danzo, io danzo come David. Si lo Spirito di Dio si mueva a mi, io danzo come David. See the spirit of the dear sweep on me, your dance of Como Dabi. Your dance, oh, your dance, oh, your dance of Como Dabi. Your dance, oh, your dance, oh, your dance of Como Dabi. See the spirit of the dear sweep on me, your dance of Como Dabi. See the spirit of the dear sweep on me, your dance of Como Dabi. Your dance, oh, your dance.
te guarde y bendiga que extienda su amor te muestra favor yo te mir con agrado y te
Come on, everybody. Let's give God praise for the blessing. We feel the blessing. You may be seated in the Lord's presence. The worship team does such an amazing job today. Thank you guys so very much. Come on, let's give God praise for them. Thank you, my brothers. Well, what an exciting day it is in the life of our church. Uh, there are certain days that we mark on the calendar. And again, my name is Ken, I'm one of the members of the Justice and Rec team, as well as one of the pastors here on staff. Today, again, is very special for us because of the church. We get to set this month aside, and in particular, this day aside, to celebrate Hispanic heritage. And as part of the committee to help will decide all the details of this service, uh, nothing was more important to us than finding the right person that God had selected to come and be the keynote speaker for today and give the address. And as God would have it, that person is very familiar here at Common Ground Northeast. This person's been on our stage on numerous occasions, wears a lot of hats here, uh, great personality, great a part of our church, always blesses us. And so today, as part of the Justice and Reconciliation team, it's my honor uh, to introduce the person that God set aside right here under our nose to come and give the address on this day of celebration. Would you help me give a very warm common ground welcome to our very own floor, Skidmore. God bless you. Okay, it is on. Hi, everyone. Like Pastor Ken said, I'm Flor Ramos Gitmore, and I've been a member of the congregation for a number of years, as long as my youngest has been alive, so over six years in this campus, and then sometime prior on the West Campus of Common Ground Northeast. Now, I'll be a miss if I don't start uh, with a prayer, and, and this prayer is of thankfulness, really, because you guys just gave me a great gift. Paul, thank you. You know that blessing song? I think you know it in English. I've sang it so much, and it's not, it wasn't written in Spanish, it was written in English. Um, and I've sang it many times, and I pray it. When I sing it, I pray it over the people I love. And I see my best friend, and I see my children, and, and I see my family members. But today, you gave me the gift of saying that in the tongue that I call native. And it was different. It was different, and it was a huge gift, so I want to Thank God for that, and please pray with me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the spaces that you open for us to exist and to be in many places. Thank you for the places you call us to be born at, for the places you call us to visit, for the places you call us to identify with. Thank you for the gift of opening hearts and opening ears to hear your word to be able to use those words to bless others in your name. We ask that you open your, our ears and our hearts today for what your spirit wants to say to us and that you make me a worthy vessel of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Awesome. Um, so, you know I'm a trained speaker. I grew up in theater and so Generally speaking, comes it looks like it comes easy to me, but I'm actually an introvert. So this takes a lot of energy. So it's my gift to you. So I hope you receive it as well. But I was sharing with Pastor Ken earlier, this message is not from me. I wrote it. I wrote it, but it's not mine. It wasn't mine from the beginning. It's the spirits, and I hope you receive it as such. I want to talk to you today in the context of me, we, you know, Pastor Ken and Pastor Eric have done a really good job at explaining what it's like to have a personal identity but also belong to a citizenship that's not from this earth, right? To be in community, to flip that M to a W. Well, we cannot talk about that without talking about identity. And when I think about identity uh, in the context of the kingdom of God, the very first place I go to is, well, the beginning in Genesis, right? If you go with me, I think we're going to put it on the screen. Uh, to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. I redacted some of it for the focus of this message. Um, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 says, So God created mankind 
in his good is in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. This principle is one of the founding principles of our church, the Imago Dei, to treat everyone like they're the image of God. When I read this verse, I immediately go to that garden, the Garden of Eden. Have you imagined what that, that was like? Of course you have, and probably when you were growing up, if you grew up in a church, you saw many pictures of what it, should, it would have been. We tend to focus on the one tree, right? The one tree with the forbidden fruits, and all the telenovela that happened afterwards. Um, but I think about the garden itself. What was planted there? What did it look like? Right? I think of a field of wildflowers, like the one picture. Of it. And I think of its biodiversity. God is really creative. We are creative because he created first. You realize that, right? And he has crazy ideas, I tell you. Like there's flowers of every color with seeds showing, seeds not. Flowers that can reproduce on their own, flowers that need each other to reproduce or to produce fruit. We have different types of fruits that grow in different types of, of vines and bushes and trees of different sizes. And we have nuts and we have so much. We even have flowers that eat animals. Insects, I guess, technically. I digress. How crazy is that? It's pretty insane if you ask me, but this was his design. And I believe that to be true. His design was biodiverse. I often wonder if the reason I go back to the garden so much is because my name in Spanish, Flor, literally means flower in Spanish. So besides being a flower, who else am I? Many of us identify ourselves when we go in conversations and you introduce to someone, you're like, hi, I'm so-and-so. And what is the first thing you ask? What's your name? What do you do? White culture is very intense about like the value that you bring to the table. What can I use you for? How can you use me? How can we make gain together? Where I'm from, we say where we're from. Yeah. Hi, my name is Flor. I'm from Santa Tecla. El Salvador. That's where I'm, I was born, where I grew up, in El Salvador. Because it's more important to us to know the family around us, the context in which we grew up. That lets people know a lot of things. If I meet someone from Soyapango, I know they've seen a lot of violence, probably, because it's been one of our most unsafe neighborhoods for decades. But if I meet someone from La Union, I can assume they're probably agricultures, you know, working the land or working the A lot can be learned by knowing who you, where you're from, right? So in this context, I first identify myself as Hispanic or Latina, which I'm sure is terms that you already heard, but what does it even mean to be Hispanic or Latina? You may think that Hispanic and Latino is an ethnic group, right? And I don't blame you if you do, because like we have all filled out those government forms where like you have a box, right? And you decide like whether you're Hispanic or non-Hispanic, and then you move on to your race, right? And that's even an advancement from the 1970s. In the 1970s, we were put in the same bucket as race. Um, but in truth, we're not an ethnic group. We are in a pan-ethnicity. Pan ethnicity is a collection, a group of ethnicities that are put together for documentation purposes. So I identify myself as Latina, but Latina is not a name that I gave myself. It's a name that was given to me in this American context. I identify myself as Hispanic, but Hispanic was not a name that was given to me for, by my family. It was a name that was given to me here in this context. You call me Hispanic and Latina, and therefore I have assumed that identity. I'm an immigrant. I think it's very clear that I'm not from here. Some people can tell because of the accent, some people because of my unruly waves, some people can tell because of my really brown eyes with bright, um, desperate need for like enjoyment, and I'm like, oh, no, she's not from here. She's not Polish. 
I am an immigrant from El Salvador. And although my experience culturally is unique in this church, I am not the only one that shares the identity of immigrant. I know there's many of us in the congregation, but I want to talk about four of us in a specific. Um, Omar, who's in the back, hi, with his wife, Lavinia, who's also an immigrant. But Omar is from Bolivia in South America. And then Rico, who's not here today, we will forgive him because it is fall break, but I'm going to take a little pause. Have you ever been a minority in a group and enter a room that is full of people who don't look like you? You probably are familiar with this experience. The first thing you do when you walk into the room and you see no one like you, you scan it. Like, where are my brown people at? And even though I don't talk to my Latinos in the room every Sunday, I know exactly where they sit. Omar is over there, Rico is over there in this general area where they're seated because we are a church that hides in the back. And then Alicia over here, it's always in this area, usually a little bit in the front. I think I stole your row today, I'm sorry. Um, so Rico, by his nickname is Puerto Rico. His, his actual name is Emmanuel. Imagine this, his name is Emmanuel but he is so connected to his cultural identity that his nickname is the name of his country, Rico, right? He sits over there, and then Alicia, she was born in California, uh, but her mother is from Valencia, Spain, and she identifies with it. Four people, look at all those colors in our flags. Those flags mean something to us, we identify with it. In fact, most Hispanic or Latino people in the census and, and Pew Research forms, when they select other, they put the name of the country they're from. Because that's how we want to identify ourselves. That's where we're really from, right? Now, if I were to bring Alicia and Omar and Rico to the front with me, you will notice some similarities right away. We're all brown. Most of us have some form of wavy hair, right? Brown eyes. And we speak the same language. We all speak Spanish to a degree. But even though we look similar, we are not the same. No offense. But we are not the same. Now, I need you to educate me sometime. Because I don't know this. I've been questioning this for quite some time. I don't know if it is human instinct or is it a nuance of the white culture specifically? But I notice in this context a desire to make everything the same. To build standards. And there's so much evidence of it. Like, for example, I, I look at my neighborhood. Okay? I live in a suburban area in the far east side and what I notice is that our subdivisions are made with homes of the same size, cookie cutter, same designs. They're not the same color, you get that, but they're all in the same palette and there's restrictions as to what color you get to paint your home and your mailbox, oh, the HOA controls that and it's all the same for everyone and it has your address and if something happens to the mailbox, we'll replace it for you for a fee. And that fee also goes to upkeeping all the green areas and common areas to make them look up tight, tidy up, right? And then all, there's rules as to how to keep our lawn, where to keep our flowers, what kind of trees to grow, right? And there's penalties. I know that firsthand. Like if, if your grass grows further than four inches, you get a first warning. And if you don't abide, it escalates from there. There are rules. And there seems to be this desire for sameness, a standardization, to make everything look the same color green, with the same patterns, with little room. There's room, but little room for individuality. And I find in this context that we have learned to equate that sameness, that standardization, as good. Oh, they're a good neighbor because their yard is upkept. Oh, I don't know what's happening with that house because their yard is all messed up. So you tell me, is that... An contextual thing for white people or is it a cultural norm? I don't understand. Another thing I don't understand is the obsession to cover soil. 
where I'm from, plants grow, period. And you may water them, but it rains quite regularly, so we don't really, they just grow. Uh, and dirt happens, grass happens, wildflowers happens, and it's your choice if you want to take the time to pull out wildflowers and plant them somewhere else or just ignore them. I grew up ignoring them because they're beautiful and they help pollination. But here, we're not comfortable with dirt. What is it about the Midwest that loves the mulch so much? I don't see the visual appeal. It's almost the same color as soil, so what's the difference? I digress. I wonder if it's just the aesthetics or if we're using aesthetics as a proof of developed civilization, of our advanced nature, of being better than. Whether it's the color green of the yard or the behavior we seek of one another, the sameness has gotten in the way of true relationships. Speaking about truth, here's our truth. Even though we are put in the same box, Hispanic or Latino, yes or no, we are not monolithic. We have different cultures. And honestly, even in those things that unite us, there's hurt. I speak Spanish the way that Omar speaks Spanish, Enrico speaks Spanish, because of the poor choices of our ancestors, not because of my choice. Our ethnicities are different because they're not only ruled by the conquistador that came over to try to work the land, they are also ruled by the peoples that inhabited the land before they did, and the peoples before that, and the peoples before that. Humans were nomads and settlers. Right? Through human history, no matter where you're from, you'll find a pattern of nomad, moving and settling, moving and settling. Our land is no different. And all of the cultures that inhabited that land left us with something, a belief, a respect, unspoken rules of behavior. In our congregation, uh, Rico, for example, he's from Puerto Rico, that land was inhabited by Tainos. Now, again with the nomenclature, Taino is not the name of the peoples that live there. Tainos is the name that the Spaniards gave the peoples because they were saying that word over and over again. Taino in Arawak means noble. They thought the Spaniards were nobles and they were calling them nobles and therefore Spaniards who didn't understand call them Tainos back. Isn't that ironic? So the Tainos are actually from the Amazon. They're settlers that came from the, from the Amazon uh, to uh, settle the, the Caribbean, some Caribbean lands. And the Spaniards, when encountering them, associated them with um, good in nature and matriarchal were the words that they said. Good fishermen and good agriculturers. Now, the good in nature also is relative because they were good in nature and compared to the Caribs who were like breaking the Spaniards down. But some of that culture stayed with Rico today. Omar, Omar in South America is Guarani. The Guarani is inhabited that land. And something that was really important about Guarani is they, they were agricultures too, but they were pantheists. They had many, many gods. The one thing that they respected above all is Mother Earth. Not Goddess Earth, Mother Earth. Omar was so kind to share with me one of the traditions that are still uphold in his land is when there's a party, a celebration, a special meal prepared, people grab a few bites, the first bites of their meal, and dig a little hole in the land and share it back with Mother Earth as a way to thank her for her gift. Isn't that beautiful? I want to behave like that, but that's the what I need. And then Alicia, she's Iberian. The Iberian people, <laughs> you may think that Spaniards are like clean race on, a, on, the, on their own, but they're not. The Iberian Peninsula was inhabited by multiple peoples. They were natives, but they were also Phoenicians and Greeks. 
that inhabited that land before the Romans came over and took over. And then there's the whole mix up with the Moors. They are a mixed people to begin with, right? Um, and particularly in Alicia's story, her grandparents believe that they are Jewish, not in religion, but in culture. Because there's a rich Jewish history in Spain too. Now, I don't have time to go into all that, but I encourage you to look up all of our people so you understand a little bit better about our culture. I personally, I'm now Wapipil. Now, the worst thing, the worst thing that you could tell me is like, are you Mexican? No offense to Mexico, but now I understand a little bit better why. Um, some people attribute it to like a soccer rivalry or trade rivalry, not at all. So, pipiles are peoples who immigrated from uh, Mexico, actually. Before Mexico was Aztec, there were two big groups, the Mexicas and the Toltecs. And they were figuring out how to like coordinate together by war, I'm not going to get uh, gruesome over here, but by word, they were trying to like unify the peoples into one big imperium. And my people said, no, thank you. I want to keep my monies for myself. You know why? There were huge agricultures of cocoa and cotton. We had the technology and cocoa was precious. It was only given to nobles. And the, the, the process to, to get it to where it's consumable was so extraneous. It was a craft. And so my people decided, I don't want to be part of your empire. I'm going to find somewhere else to go do my business. So they migrated south and they settled in between mountains into the valleys of El Salvador. They created two cities that were mostly econom like economy based on cocoa, uh, cotton, and indigo. We were the ones to treat cotton with indigo in this land. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. We were also fighters, and I'm proud to say Pipiles were the first to identify the Spaniards. No, that's a threat. Let's fight it. And we heard one of the Spaniard commanders, and he limped on his left leg for the rest of his life. That was me. Yes, sir, that was me. Because of how mixed we are with the Spaniard culture that came upon us, and because of the fruits of the land that we shared, America is very consistent throughout on the fruits um, that the land gives. Our food kinds of uni kind of unite us, but like we found ways to like treat the fruits in different ways. For example, um, we all have maize, which you know as corn, indigenous to Americas, beans, squash, chili peppers, tomatoes. I don't know what Italians ate before. 1492. Or what Russians ate before 1492 because yuca, cassava, and potatoes are from here too. I digress. Peanuts, avocados, amaranth, and some types of wild rice, they all belong here. So we all found different ways to use those foods to, to create something new. Uh, for Rico, that looks like mofongo. We also had influences from Africa because of the slave trade and we introduced the plantain, the banana here. And so in Puerto Rico on the right there, they use mofongo, which is plantain mashed with seafood and other spices, you know, into one single meal that was packed with nutrients um, that the commoners will eat. Now, Alicia grew up eating paella on the bottom left. At least once a week, they use the seafood to cook the rice right, and let it simmer slowly on um, similar spices as well. For uh, Omar, he eats churrasco for celebrations, which is meat, you know, it's like a, the Latin American version of barbecue. But the, the commoners, the indigenous people used to drink and still drink to this day chicha, which is a fermented corn drink that I also enjoy in my home country as well with some variations. I treat the corn to make pupusas, to make hominy first, and that hominy gets turned into tortillas that get stuffed with goodness. Traditionally, before the conquest, we will eat them with beans and squash inside. After the conquest, we introduce cheese and pork into the mix, and now we have perfected 
the recipe is delicious. We have each settled roots, some deeper than others. Here, where we're planted in this Indiana garden, yet we each bring some unique flavor to the table, right? A dichotomy unites us because we're not from here, technically, but we belong here. This is our land. To be honest, and I need you to hear this, the same can be said about white culture. You're not from here. You think you are, but you're not. This is not your land either. You're an immigrant too. Your ancestors immigrated here too. I like to think of white immigrants like the dandelion. I'm sure you're familiar with dandelions, right? I'm sure many of us have kneeled on our gardens trying to pluck the sucker away from our green lawn. I'm not trying to offend you with it. In fact, the dandelion was brought to the Americas by the Europeans as a way of healing because the dandelion has many healing properties and it's completely edible. You can eat its root, its leaves, its greens, its seeds, its flowers, everything. So it was a no-brainer, right? Let's bring the dandelion, see if it grows here. Well, it grew, right? And now it's everywhere. So are white people. Finding belonging in other lands seemed to be a part of biblical history, too. In the Old Testament, I immediately think of Joseph. He was betrayed by his siblings, right? And then taken to a different land as slave. And even though that was not his land, God had it in his plan to make something of him in that land. Something royal, even. Let's think about Jesus. How many nationalities do you think Jesus would have had? Jesus himself built a community around him of various peoples that were other than. Um, yet, he made them belong in a single group. Jews, Gentiles, Egyptians, Romans, fishermen, tax collectors, women, soldiers. Latinos in common ground, along with the rest of the congregation, find commonality in the God we serve. And we don't come without tools. In fact, the Bible itself gives us tools to learn how to treat each other and be different than while still remain the same. These beliefs may have been imposed to some of us by other cultures, but my hope is that conviction you have found is unique no matter where you're from. These beliefs do not negate our individuality, the me, but rather grants us the opportunity to enrich the we. These beliefs can lead to effective tools to live in community under Jesus' ex example. I go to the Old Testament first because I'm a good Catholic girl and you have to see the whole picture when you're universal like that. In the Old Testament, um, when thinking about commandments, you know, it's, it's easy to go to Exodus and see the 10 and read of Moses. It's easier than do Leviticus, which is hella boring, but it actually provides a little bit more segmentation and more detail on how God instructed the people in the desert to behave. Uh, in chapter 19 particularly, is solely about how to treat your neighbor. There's two verses I want to share with you. The first one, verse 18. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people. I don't hate you, white people, I promise. But love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And then verse 33. When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native Born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. You've been there too. I am the Lord, your God. 
Now, the rhetoric changed a little bit in the New Testament, right? When we talk uh, in Matthew 22 about the greatest command, love one another, like, love God with all your heart and, and your mind and your might and, and uh, love each other. Yeah. Love your neighbor. But I also think of what Paul wrote to the Galatians in chapter 3. Chapter 20, uh, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave or free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Mm. And that's our truth, not my truth as Latin American, your truth as black or white. Our truth is that when love is at the core of our Christian expression, bridging those gaps between our identities, our multidimensionality becomes achievable. Now watch the choice of words, achievable, not easy, but achievable. When we take time to learn our history, where we actually come from, and when we own up to where we are, we can have a better picture of the role that we play in building this kingdom for God. So I spoke a few of them, the lions, and I'm gonna be honest too. I truly believe that this dandelions can be the healing they were intended to provide when they were brought into this land. I need you to be the healing you were created to provide to this land. It's funny to think of each culture, you know, each gift as a different part of the body, which is another thing that Paul did. Because imagine, what would a body be made of just eyes? Just kidding, that's an angel. <laughs> Look it up. But what would a garden be if only filled with dandelions? Would it be a garden? Would it be an ecosystem? It's just a plantation. When we take the time, like Jesus did, to get to know one another beyond the what we do, beyond even where we're from, we foster an environment of inclusion and safety for cultural expression in the way that God wants it, because he does want it, and we also have evidence of this in the Bible. I go to Revelations chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, for briefly, I know that I'm, I'm taking my time, but Revelations chapter 7 says, after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried loud, in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now, I want you to indulge me. I did not grow up in a fundamentalist church, but I did go to college in a fundamentalist context. And there is one thing that I gather from this context, their ability to praise God in song like no one else can, to read themselves of like any shame and the oneness of, of the community sing a cappella, multiple songs, hymns. I consider them beautiful, and I know my husband does appreciate them too. So indulge me. I will lead us in singing a hymn. Okay. I'll put the lyrics up there. Mallory, I'm sure you got them. Yep. It's very simple. Um, but this is what Revelation says. John heard that multitude sing. And I believe us to be that multitude. We are that church. So let's be that church today. Would you join me in singing? 
Salvation belongs to our God who sits upon the throne. It's that loud voice, people. And to the Lamb, praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Be to our God forever and ever. Be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the words you have placed in our minds, in our hearts, for the way you're speaking to our soul. May we find it in our hearts room to let go of our comfort, of our sameness in the way that we understand it today, and to engage one another intentionally with an authentic desire to learn who each one of us is and where that each thing comes from because we all come from you. May we learn to love one another, celebrating the ways our differences make us stronger for your body, for your kingdom, for your glory. Amen. Can I go? <laughs> Come on, everybody, let's give God praise for his word once again. Well, that was just amazing. Amen. So thank God for our dear sister Floor and her rendition from her perspective on the me, we subject that we've been preaching through uh, for the last few weeks. And so we thank God for that. Thank God also for Rico, for Omar and Alicia for lending your voices to uh, in your experiences uh, to the sermon today. God is good, God is faithful. It is impossible to come into God's house, hear God's word, be challenged at the level that you and I were just challenged today without giving a response. The word of God requires a response. Flora did an amazing job challenging us today. And as she said, they weren't her words, they were the Holy Spirit's. And she took us to several scriptures, and it was right there for us to contemplate. And then she prayed for us. And now the word of God resonating in our hearts, our lives, our spirits, undeniable. We were here. We just heard it. We have to do something with it. There are several things that we can do here at Common Ground to respond to the word of God. We can commit to singing unto the Lord a new song in just a minute. Our praise team is going to lift their voices. And we can sing the song of restored and renewed heart, renewed spirit, renewed position, renewed disposition, more enlightenment. In conjunction with that, we can commit to a life of prayer, praying for the things that Floor just put out there for us. All of those things being ambition for us now, goal, safe place, desire, God's we, and to our collective voices going back to God's we, everybody praying the same prayer with the same heart and with the same mind. We can give to that initiative, give the Bible said, and it shall be given unto you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. All of us giving toward the same objective. The restored we in Psalm 100, God's we, everybody's first we, our first try. That floor so eloquently brought us back to today then finally let's commune today if you don't have your elements would you move now and get your elements and we'll commune around a lot of the ideas 
Thank you for lifting your voice and song floor. I truly love the a cappella hymns. The word of the Lord in Matthew 26, we'll read it together, communing around the ideas and the challenges that we've just heard today in the word of God. And our celebration isn't over, by the way, because we're going to have cake together. The Bible declared that while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. And he said to them, take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them as well. Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives and after a few minutes of contemplation, reflection, the things that you heard from Floor today, the word of the Lord, me, we, and her rendition, they take the Lord's Supper. Bless you. Amen, amen. What a mighty God we serve. 
The celebration is not over today. We invite everyone to repass in the back. There's special cake though, and Dr. Martha is going to come now and tell us a little bit about the celebration cake that we're about to consume. Then I'll come back and we'll be dismissed. So today we are serving Tres Leches cake to everyone in honor of Hispanic Heritage Month. It is a sponge cake soaked in three kinds of milk, evaporated, condensed, and whole milk. It is claimed by many Latin American countries as a dessert for celebration. So please join us in celebrating this occasion and our dear brothers and sisters by enjoying a delicious slice of Tres Leches cake. Amen. Thank you so very much. Everyone's invited to join us. Would you all stand with us at this time? Hallelujah. May his favor be upon you. Would you go today knowing that you are a part of the body of Christ, that you're essential, that there's no substitute for you, but that God would ask you to lend your voice to the all earth choir. Go knowing today that God made you special, God made you unique, no matter what land you come from, what was your native tongue. But today, you lift up that voice as part of his heavenly choir. We are all sheep, and he is the shepherd. Would you go today and walk into the leadership that the shepherd provides? Go be the church today. Go be one. Go reclaim God's way. God bless you. Go in Jesus' name. I'll dance, I'll dance like David I'll dance 